Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship, when we remember who we are and whose we are, no matter where we are. Today is Reformation Sunday, when we also remember that we are the church reformed and always being reformed, according to the word of God and the call of the Spirit. We had great participation at our hygiene kit packing event last Sunday. Several dozen people came out in the wet but not rainy weather to drop off donations and many stayed to pack up and bless approximately 175 hygiene kits for the broken bus and for Brethren Disaster Ministry. What a blessing it is that we can continue to bless others through our abundance in a time when many are struggling. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Join with me in this litany that interweaves Martin Luther's great Reformation hymn with the words from scripture that inspired it, the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, Though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of this city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter, God speaks, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. God makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. God breaks the bow, shatters the spear, and burns the shields with fire.
and know that the Lord is God. God is exalted among the nations. God is exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us put aside our good works and remember that we do sin and fall short of the glory of God. Trusting in God's grace in Jesus Christ, let's show our willingness to be reformed, first confessing as a community and then in silent personal prayer. When we want to be a church ever reforming, yet cling to comfortable ways, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. When we want to honor your still speaking voice, but are fearful of insights which challenge old assumptions, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. When we give lip service to grace, but live as if our good works save us, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. We are saved by grace alone through faith in the Jesus Christ made known to us in the scriptures. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation or lose it. It's all in the loving and faithful hands of our creator. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our salvation is secure in Jesus Christ, and we long for others to know the peace of this good news. The peace of the Lord be with you. Share the gift of peace you have in Jesus with those around you this week. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Light and Darkness from Growing in God's Love, a story Bible, based on 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. This story comes from books written by a person named John. They are letters with a lot of advice, things the writer wants you to remember. Imagine if your grandparents or aunt or uncle or teacher wrote you a letter or sent you a text message about something really important about how you were supposed to live. Here's what John said. It's been a long time since Jesus lived among us, so I want to write to you and help you remember some of the things he taught us. Before I tell you these things, imagine yourself on top of a hill on a warm summer day. 
Flowers and tall grasses are all around you blowing in the breeze. The sun is shining and feels so nice and warm. You shut your eyes and lift your face towards the sun. It feels so good that you never want to leave that place. Now imagine that you are in a very dark room. It doesn't feel like before. Someone who loves you very much brings in a candle. The light from that candle brightens the room, and the room is not as dark as before. Jesus taught us that God wants us to live in the light, not the dark. To live in the light means to live in love. God is light because God is love. Jesus taught us to love God and to love others. Jesus also wants us to remember that we are not perfect. We make mistakes. When we tell God about our mistakes and ask for forgiveness, God will always forgive us. When we pray to God and love one another, we are living in the light. Light will always be stronger than darkness. Even the smallest candle can brighten a dark room. You can make this world brighter by loving God and loving one another. What do you think? God forgives us and shows us goodness even when we do not expect it or deserve it. That is called grace. Think of a time when you made a mistake. Did you say you were sorry? Did you tell God you were sorry? How can you live in the light with God and with others? Make a prayer journal with a pad of paper. Decorate it with markers, stickers. Write your prayers to God in it. Tell God about how you are going to live in the light. Please join me in prayer and repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of grace. We make mistakes and you freely give us forgiveness and goodness. For that, we will always be grateful. Help us to share the light of your love with all those we meet. Amen. As we turn to God's word, please pray with me. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we meet King David, who is experiencing the fulfillment of one of God's promises to Abram back in Genesis 12, they have claimed the promised land, vanquished their enemies, and established their kingdom. But God has still more promises yet to make. Listen to God's word as it comes to us in 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 17. Now when David the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am, giving, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Whenever I have moved about all the peoples of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel when I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, 
Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the, the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My kids both have spring birthdays, and this year, because we were in the middle of COVID, we bought them this little two-person tent so they could escape us and we them. It was like a little clubhouse outside of our house. Owen wanted to sleep in it. Claire did not, but being a good big sister, she consented one summer night to pitching the tent in our living room. As I equipped them with flashlights and tucked them into their fluffy sleeping bags, I knew this wasn't going to last long. You see, Claire is very particular about how she sleeps. She likes her own bed and the sound machine set on ocean waves only, the room pitch black and the closet doors and the bedroom door shut tight. So before I had zipped the flap closed to keep the cats from assuming it was a litter box, Claire had clambered out of the tent and upstairs to her bedroom sanctuary. Owen was heartbroken and I couldn't bear his little face. So I hastily brushed my teeth and climbed in next to him, feeling like such a good mom for sacrificing my comfy bed to be with my son. In today's story, King David and Claire seem to be of the same mind. Why live in a tent if you don't have to? When we meet David in this chapter, he's already led Israel through battle to victory, and he's conquered Jerusalem and made it the capital city. As he sits in his strong and lavish palace, he reflects on the fact that the God of Israel still resides in the Ark of the Covenant, and his people don't have a permanent place to worship where God can settle down. It was a predictable move for a new king to seek to make Jerusalem the religious capital as well as the political capital, and to build a magnificent temple to honor the God who had brought them victory. Most kings did this, and the temples not only honored the king's particular God of choice, but also added to the king's own honor and legacy. Although we don't know David's motivations for sure, it's likely they were a mix of gratitude and duty, ambition, self-promotion, and perhaps a little guilt for living in a nicer place than God. But repeating the now familiar pattern, Israel's God proves not to be like other gods. The Holy One of Israel doesn't want or need the same things. When David offers to build God a permanent house, God says, mm, no thanks. Actually, I'm gonna build you a permanent house, a dynasty. Clever, right? This is, of course, good news that leads to the eventual good news of the gospel, but it does pose a few problems for David and God's people. First, God keeps flipping the familiar pattern of interaction between gods and humans. Here's how it worked for everyone else. When they wanted something, like say, victory in battle, they made sacrifices to God. Animals, harvest, gold. If they weren't victorious, they knew they needed to sacrifice more the next time. If they were victorious, 
then they made sacrifices in Thanksgiving, maybe building God a nice temple, hoping that it would be enough to stay on God's good side. The God of Israel keeps rewriting the script though. As David sees it, it's his turn to do something for God. But God says David doesn't need to do anything for God in order for God to continue to bless him. It's an unconditional covenant and it's unheard of, but it's exactly the kind of thing we champion on Reformation Sunday. You know, the idea that we're saved by grace alone and not anything that we ourselves do. David is reminded that though he is king, he is not the primary mover of the relationship. God is the provider. He is the receiver. The second problem the Israelites will face is that worshiping a God who lives in a box and travels around in a tent is not very impressive and doesn't communicate a lot of power. Now that they're settled, God should settle down too. Get comfortable. American Jews and Christians are probably hearing this story differently than we've ever heard it before. We're listening to God tell us that God doesn't need a house in a season where most of us have been unable to worship in our beautiful sanctuaries in order to protect one another from the virus spreading. I know that you miss your sanctuary, the place that you go to feel God's presence. Even the word sanctuary indicates a place of safety and security. Over thousands of years, in times of uncertainty, people have flocked to their holy places, churches and synagogues, temples and mosques. Think about how people in the United States responded in the days after the attacks on September 11th. That's not really an option in this pandemic though. The patterns, traditions, and places that have made us feel safe and connected to God are not available to us right now. And that unsettled feeling often has us feeling out of control. While the setting of this story is a time of success and peace for Israel, it might be interesting to know that this story wasn't written down and preserved as scripture until the Babylonian exile some 400 years later. Israel believed that God was uh, uniquely present in the temple. And so their exile meant being locked out of God's presence in a sense. They were during that time spiritually homeless living apart from all that was familiar and comfortable to them. This story was an important reminder that while humans seem to need the stability of big buildings and familiar surroundings, God doesn't need that. God reminds David and the exiled Israelites and us that the divine presence has been with them in tents, in the pasture, among their sheep, and in battle. God, of course, is not contained within a building. God's message here is that God's presence and providence have been active for generations without a temple. When we feel the most out of control, God is reassuringly in control. But lest we fool ourselves, this passage also reminds us that God is in control even when we, like David, feel like we're at the top of our game. So God says no thank you to David's offer to build God a house and promises instead to build David a house, a dynasty that will last forever. As Christians, we look at this promise through the lens of our faith in Christ and recognize that the never ending kingdom God will establish through David's line will belong to Christ the King. This may be a hopeful enough reminder of the tenacity of God's kingdom, but I think there's even more good news to be had connected to this passage. In one of the most beloved passages in the Gospels, John writes in his prologue of Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is literally the verb form of the word tabernacle. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. The everlasting house that God will build David is a tent, not a fortress, not a palace, not a temple adorned in gold. The divine lives among us in a tent, and that's by design. 
Tents are mobile. They're accessible. They're most helpful in the wilderness. They're able to be formed and reformed as often as needed. It's true, tents are vulnerable, fragile even, but the tent's fragility is the price paid for its ability to go where it's needed. A God who is truly with us. At least once during my youth ministry days, I participated in a box city with several youth groups. We pitched tents and made dwellings out of cardboard boxes on the grounds of one of the churches, sleeping in them on one chilly spring night in an attempt to better understand what it's like to be homeless and living on the streets. It was uncomfortable and cold. I couldn't escape the street lights and noises, and I was constantly on alert in case someone would approach us who wasn't friendly. In our current season of hardship and uncertainty, it seems appropriate, as biblical scholar Linda Lee Clater says, to linger for a moment over the idea of a God who is constantly ready to pull up stakes and move where we go, sleep where we sleep, and be buffeted by the same winds that blow sand in our eyes and tear the roofs off the shelters we erect. This God goes before us and sticks with us and doesn't wait to see what he'll get out of it before he blesses us, but provides exactly what we need in every season. God is on the move all the time, preferring to be out on the streets rather than in a gilded temple. Remember, Jesus touched the lives of many, many people who were not allowed inside the temple walls. But even if they had been allowed, they likely wouldn't have felt they belonged there. We, the church, are the body of Christ in the world now, called to be in the world as Jesus was in the world. While we grieve the immense hardship this global ban pandemic has been on people all over the world, might there be some grace and blessing for the church in being separated from our beloved sanctuaries and comforting traditions during this time? Like the Israelites in exile, we can take this time to remind ourselves how God moves with us and provides for us whether we live in a palace or find ourselves uprooted from all that's comfortable and familiar. We can celebrate the gift of grace that requires nothing from us and keeps no score and gives us the keys to the kingdom without us even asking or paying rent. We can also take this time to learn to be more like our agile king, risking comfort, familiarity, and even security to be with people in the wilderness. What would it look like, I wonder, for Sugar Creek to pitch a tent among the people? Maybe we would rediscover the strength in Jesus' vulnerability and realize that one of the king keys to God's everlasting kingdom is its willingness to move and change, to be built and rebuilt, formed and reformed again and again, to stay close to people and accessible to everyone. We are used to hearing these passages about an uncontained God from well-contained sanctuaries, a grace-filled God from positions where we don't actually feel like we need much grace. So let's not miss the power of this passage for this time. Physical houses are, of course, not the core of God. Grace, presence, and providence are. Let's also not miss the invitation to be God's uncontained people, reformed again and again, to unleash God's undeserved blessing to a world in need. Amen. Thank you.
Giving is a huge part of being a faithful Christian, but we give not because we believe it earns us God's favor, but because we are so grateful for what God has done for us in Jesus. In gratitude and faithfulness, let's remember to share God's tithe and our offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's turn our hearts to God in prayer. Grace-filled God, on this Reformation Sunday, we thank you for those you have poured your spirit into that have reformed your church to be more faithful. We thank you that you are still at work in the life of the church, reforming us, reshaping us, and remaking us in your image. We reflect your image, steadfast God, in how we care for one another with love, care, and prayer. And so we pray for healing for those we know and those we do not know, for those who are in the hospitals today and those at home with illnesses, pains, and recovering from treatments or surgeries, for those in nursing homes and their families during these times. We pray for those struggling financially and for those struggling mentally. We pray for those who are facing death and for those who are grieving. We pray for doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and caregivers. Lord, may we, your church, reflect your image in our loving, our caring, and our praying. We reflect your image, holy God, in how we love, care, and pray for the world, too. We pray for those around the world who face persecution, imprisonment, and even martyrdom for their faith, that they may worship freely and safely. We pray for those whose countries are torn by war with other countries or with themselves. We pray for equity and abundance for those living in poverty and those who are food insecure. We pray for justice for those who are bought and sold in human trafficking. We pray for those who have lost much because of natural and human-made disasters. We pray for our country, Lord, as we prepare to elect our leaders. In all that we do, almighty God, May we put into action our love, care, and prayers for the world. Holy God and head of the church, we pray for your church that we may be a beacon of hope, grace, love, and light in this world. May our ministry reflect your open arms to all. May our presence within our community reflect your love for all. May our forgiveness of one another reflect your forgiveness for all. Bind your church together that your message may be strengthened and form and reform us until we faithfully and consistently bear the image of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May God give you grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And now, may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Thank you. 